once again I would like to welcome all of you to the third to the fourth and the second last talk of Discover Islam Week titled Misconceptions About Islam. Um, our speaker is Brother Abu Musaf. I introduced him yesterday, I don't need a fee to do it today. And uh, what is and shall let's let's begin the talk. Okay. <laughs> الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد أبرز دعوة الله the exalted might the majestic and we ask Allah to exalt the mention grant peace and send the salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم as to what follows sometimes when you address a religious topic uh, and the people who are listening to this uh, lecture do not necessarily have a religious background. Um, this creates a barrier of understanding, meaning a barrier which prevents understanding. And uh, this is why we find that Islam, if you go through the Quran and the Sunnah, they teach us the method of striking similitudes in example. You give an example of something that is related to the worldly life, and if we comprehend it properly, then we will be able to understand that religious information that was previously provided. And for me to really address the types of misconceptions about Islam, uh, I would give the following similitude. Uh, let's hypothetically assume that you have been looking for an English language institute for many years. Many people would like to improve their English, specifically uh, those who may have not learned English properly back home. And uh, personally, where I come from, this is a very common phenomenon. Everybody's trying to learn English. But finding the right institute, finding the right, uh, the, with the right timing and uh, affordability, being able to afford, a few factors have to be present for you to be able to join that particular course. And so let's assume that while you are on that, uh, you know, attempt to find a place, you receive a flyer in the mail. And that flyer has basically the best English language course you could ever dream about. The location is perfect, the timing is perfect, the duration of the course is perfect, Everything is, is agreeable and harmonious with your schedule, with your intent, and with what you have been looking for. However, the cost of the course was supposed to be 300 ringgits. Because they have levels, level 1, level 2, level 3. And via a typo, instead of putting 300 ringgits, they put 3,000 ringgits. And therefore, your dreams are shattered. After having been excited, you're reading the thing, oh, mashallah, this is it. Yep, I'm going to enroll. And then you read the number, you're like, what? 3,000 ringgits for one level of an English course? No way. I'm not going to do it. Here, this is an example of a misconception. A misconception because you think that the price is something the cost of the course is something which it really is not. However, the mistake is not on your part, it's on the part of the institute who printed this particular flyer. So until they correct that typo, and they send you an updated flyer, you will not enroll in this course. This one digit, this one zero, is a barrier between you and the course. Because of this misconception, And the word misconception, conception is the act of conceiving something. The way you conceive information, not children obviously. And it could be that. And miss is a prefix, I, I like to get into the English you know, discussion, but maybe this will be a revision for your grammar. It's a prefix, which means the lack of or the opposite of it gives a meaning other than one intended. Understanding, misunderstanding. Meaning there's lack of understanding, not a proper understanding. So conception or misconception is basically the lack of right 
of, of having the right conception of something or conceiving something properly. What does that have to do with Islam? Islam also has a lot of misconceptions. However, the difference between Islam and that English language institute is that in Islam, there are no typos. And it was not the mistake of the religion that the misconceptions exist. The misconceptions are actually an error and a fault on the part of the one who has not understood Islam. So I declare before you that the religion which I follow and over one billion people in the world follow is flawless and is perfect. There's absolutely nothing, not even 0.00001% issues with it whatsoever. The only thing that there is is a misunderstanding on the part of human beings in regard to what this religion teaches. And justice entails that when information is presented that is unbiased, we have to evaluate it and then decide accordingly. If we are predetermined in regards to our choices, whether pro or against, then we will never really be people of intellect, nor will we be leaders, nor will we be people who can guide others. Because we are ourselves confused. And this is the situation with the alcoholic who can't stop drinking alcohol and the drug addict who can't stop consuming drugs. Unless this person faces his own self or her own self, then I am at fault and that what I'm doing is not good for me or for the society. They will never stop. And you can bring all the evidences in the world to tell them about the, the harm of drugs and alcoholism. If they're not willing to make the change, they will justify their act. They will give you a hundred, rather a thousand justification for why what they're doing is, is sound and acceptable. Even though deep within they know that it is not. So when we speak about Islam, we have a lot of misconceptions. And these misconceptions have an answer. Every single misconception you can think about, that you've heard about, or you've read about, has an answer, an adequate, satisfactory answer. However, the fact that you have a satisfact satisfactory answer does not mean you'll be able to satisfy people with it. And I will simplify it for you. I will address the major misconceptions and I will shorten the speech to allow the audience to ask about their misconceptions because I don't want to regulate the speech and give you my concept of misconception without allowing you to ask what you believe is that something is wrong with Islam. So my talk will be short and the Q&A will be as long as it takes. I'm, I'm here till ne the next morning. If they allow us to stay here till the next morning, I will stay here behind this table, drinking on this bottle of water, answering your questions until you satisfy. But I cannot guarantee you satisfaction in regards to my answers. Why? Because human beings are not the same. Human beings are divided into two main categories. There are people who reject the truth after having found it, there are people who reject the truth after having found the truth. And there are people who are searching for the truth and they are looking for any direction and guidance and once provided, they accept it willingly. The first party who do not want the truth or not interested in it or any time the truth is presented, they claim it's falsehood without any justification, without any strong evidence, it's merely desires or preferences or opinions. There's nothing we can do about that. So this lecture actually is not for the one who insists on rejecting Islam and finding faults in it, because this person, from, from you know, the conclusion of which is, if, that, if Allah himself 
is not satisfactory enough for this person, how can my answer be satisfactory? The one who doesn't believe in his creator, or who believes that his creator has idols and statues, manifestation of idols and statues, this God becomes an incarnation in his creation. Or whatever other belief systems and ideologies and philosophies exist. These individuals, at the end of the day, they have a conflict with Allah himself. The creator himself, they have a conflict with him. The God himself is not satisfactory to them. So if someone is not satisfied with his creator, how can I satisfy them? Obviously, I will never be able, not myself, not anyone here, not anyone in the world. And just like we know from history, even if the angels were to come down, even when the messengers, the messengers, the chosen people will address the people, half of the people would reject them. They would come with miracles. I'm not going to be able to do any miracles. I cannot make a camel come out of a stone like with the people of Saleh. I cannot split the ocean with a stick like Moses. I cannot bring life to the dead like Jesus. I cannot split the moon like the Prophet Muhammad I can't do any of that. And prophets and messengers did that in front of their people and they could see them with their own eyes, yet they rejected them. So what I say doesn't necessarily have to convince anyone. And it is not my job or the job of anyone to force upon you that which you don't want to accept. However, you are invited to reflect. You are invited to be fair, to be just in your analysis. Look at things from a different view which you have not looked at before. Perhaps you will start understanding why we say what we say, do what we do, and why Islam teaches what it teaches. Millions of individuals have done so. And these people have become Muslim. No one can deny the huge number of people entering Islam on a daily basis. And trust me, these people are not crazy. They're not crazy. No one will leave the life of, of uh, enjoyment and entertainment and relaxation and, and all the stuff that you can do as a non-Muslim and come into a religion which we already discussed will restrict that. Specifically for the ladies. She knows she will have to wear a hijab. She, her lifestyle will change. Her dress code will change. Yet women embrace Islam more than men do. They're not crazy. They're not crazy. They're actually intelligent people. And I'm not saying that the one who does it doesn't have intelligence. I'm saying that person may not be exercising their intelligence properly. Some people use their intelligence to be crooks. To scam. To, to trick people, to rob people out of their money, to do any kind of evil business. They're intelligent, they're genius, geniuses. But they're using their intellect in the wrong way. And some people have a high you know, IQ, but they use it for that which is prosperous and beneficial. So it's about how you use your intellect. Now, Allah already told us something which if we don't understand, it would be difficult to understand anything else. Which is the fact that while you sit here now, there was a point in time which you cannot recall where you bore witness and you testified that Allah is your Lord. You don't have to remember that. And remembering that is not a condition. But this is a fact which Allah stated in the Quran. What Allah said and mentioned when Allah took from the loins, from the back of the son of Adam, from his loins, his children. And then, he's, And he made them testify against themselves. Am I not your Lord? They said, they said yes, we testify. We bear witness. Lest you say on the day of judgment, we were in regards to all of this Islam and faith and spirituality, we were heedless. In order for the people not to be able to say that on the day of judgment, one will say, I don't know, I was born in a Hindu family or a Christian family or an atheist family or whatever, and I did not know any better. How are you blaming me for not becoming a Muslim? And what is the matter with you and this whole religion of yours? You want everyone to become a Muslim? Just leave us alone. You keep your religion, we keep ours. Why are you always on our case? We're not on, our, on your case. We love you. Just plain and simple. And this love requires that what I hold to be the valuable truth, 
I, I, I want to share it with you so we can all be enjoying the life to come eternally. We as Muslims could mind our business. Trust me, this is the easiest thing in the world. We don't have to set up a booth and we don't have to print flyers and we don't have to bring people from outside to give lectures. We can just be minding our business and say we have our religion, you have yours. We don't have to worry about it. You think we go out of our way to harass people? No. On the day of judgment, it, 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 we will be held accountable for not sharing the message with you. Because we have to carry that legacy of the prophets and the messengers. So this is being done out of love. Now, sometimes when you love someone, you may hurt their feelings. When you love someone, you have to tell them the truth. When you love someone, you may not be able to accommodate everything that they want. The same way parents love their children, but they're strict with them. They love their children, so they don't let them go out at night. The child wants to go out, the, the, the untrained teenager wants to go out in body, and his father will prevent him. But his father loves him more than his friends. But because the father has this love, he's being tough with his son. Why? Because he knows that this will eventually protect the son from deviance. So this, what I would say, even though it may be, uh, it seem offensive, but that is not the, never the intention. However, the truth is, is, is sometimes is difficult to swallow. The truth sometimes is bitter. And you know, either we are brave enough to accept it, or we can just say, oh, my feelings are hurt, therefore I don't want to hear anything anymore. And you can walk out and leave and everything. But, but that's, not, that's not how people act. Intelligent people hear someone until the end. Even if they're right or they're wrong, it doesn't harm you. It doesn't harm you. So I'm advising everyone to calm down, listen, reflect, ask all the questions which you have deep within, even if they seem embarrassing, even if they seem offensive to Islam. I don't care. It could be the most offensive question in the world. I don't care. If I have an answer, I'll give it to you. If I don't have an answer, I'll say, I don't know. And, and um, before my creator, I've done my job. And before you creator, you've done your job. But we want to have this, this level of, of, of you know, uh, intelligence and, and, and maturity so we can discuss this on that level. We're not here to attack each other. I don't want to attack anyone, and no one should go out of their way to attack Islam. So the bottom line is, the ayah, no one can come on the day of judgment and say, I did not know. And I'm telling you, as you sit here right now, deep, 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 deep down in your heart, you know that there's a God. Deep inside. You can uh, put layers, many layers. The layers of desires, the layers of doubt, the layers of loving the worldly life, the layers of, of you know, adoring something other than the Creator. Many layers can be put in order to veil the heart, so that the heart is no longer a mirror that reflects the truth. And Allah described that the most adequately in the Quran. When Allah just said, "Kalla bil rana ala qulubi ma kan yaksibun." Nay, but it has, it has covered their hearts, what they used to earn. Because when you were created without any religion, without any law, without anything, you know deep inside what is right and what is wrong. You could be born on an island, never read a book, never watched TV, never heard any sermon, never heard any lecture, you don't know anything. And then you see someone beating up an animal. A duck, a chicken, and, and beating it with a stick. Do you need anyone to tell you that according to the law of the country or according to the religion this is wrong? Or do you automatically judge this person that what they have done is wrong? Let's be real. Because some people tell you, oh, we're not, we don't judge anyone. There's no such thing as judging anyone. It's not our job to judge. God is the one who judges. And God, the one who judges, judge that we judge. The judgment of God is that we are judges on earth. You will think this is a criminal act. In fact, you will interfere. And you may hold this person and say, hey, what are you doing to this poor duck? You judge that person, otherwise you wouldn't have gotten involved. This is instinct. We call it in Islam fitrah, natural disposition. The human innate nature of identifying right and wrong. And this is the same thing which lets us identify God. This is the same.
same thing which lets us, if we were to see someone bowing or prostrating or worshipping a statue, or worshipping a statue, we, inside, something is wrong in this whole concept. You say, how could that be? Who made who? When we say we worship God, that means we worship in the one who created us. But when someone is worshipping a statue, who made the statue? Who sculptured it? Who curved it? Who cleans it? Who maintains it? Who shipped it from the store to the location, the temple, the church, whatever? Who did that? Human beings. Human beings are maintaining what they're seeking maintenance from. And if a dog, excuse me, were to come and urinate on this idol, this idol cannot stop the dog. It cannot tell him, move away, I'm a god. It's, it's, it's helpless. So as a human being, I don't need all this philosophy. As a human being, once you see that, this already, the, the fitra, the natural disposition already has a, has a radar. It has a gauge. And you recognize also in this particular act. Because the creator is one that cannot be seen. Allah. The first misconception that the, the non-Muslims have about Islam is the concept of the word Allah and Allah Himself. They say this Allah is Muslim God. The Muslims have a God, His name is Allah. And the Jews and the Christians have a God, His name is God. For the English speakers that is. But if you go to Spanish, Dios and French, Dieu, and uh, you know, it depends on the religion, or the language, I'm sorry, you will have different names for this God. And so there's this idea that is being propagated that Allah is like a, an exclusive God of Muslims. The amazing, amazing thing is that the, the most basic facts are present before the eyes of the people. For example, for the Christians, I say for the Christians, go and buy an Arabic Bible. Buy an Arabic Bible, the one that the Arab Christians and Arab Jews may refer to, Old Testament and New Testament, and then open the book of Genesis and read. It says in the book of Genesis, in the Bible, fil bad'i khalaqallahu as-samawati wal -ard. In the beginning, Allah created the heavens and the earth. So you speak to a Lebanese Christian and you say, how are you doing? And he will say to you, Alhamdulillah. See you tomorrow, Inshallah. These are Arab Christians and Jews who refer to Allah as Allah. Because that is simply, simply the name of the Creator in Arabic. Jesus, peace be upon him. And some people, by the way, were not happy that, you know, as Muslims were speaking about other religions. It was some of the feedback which I got. That, that we, you know, why, why do you have to speak about other religions? Uh, you just, just highlight what is good in your religion and leave other people alone. And I, as much as I agree with that, but the truth of the matter is, many people, unless they become aware of some of the issues in their own religion, they will not be able to look outside the box. Meaning someone thinks that their religion is 100% sound and correct and preserved and protected and authentic and so on and so forth. You can tell them many things about Islam and they will say, oh, nice, that's some nice stuff, man. Yeah, I like it. Okay, are you going to become Muslim? No. I, I have my religion, it's also good. So you have a religion, we have to highlight the issues for the person to realize that they may be something. And their religion, which they thought was sound, but turned out not to be sound. At the end of the day, it's impossible that you have encompassed your religion completely. It's impossible that a Christian can quote the whole Bible to us, or can stand here on a microphone and read the whole Bible from memory. Even though we can bring a few Muslims who read the whole Quran from memory, even though they don't speak Arabic. They don't speak Arabic. But I, sometimes one, one biblical evidence Reference cannot be provided. That's a sign. That's a sign that what you're following is what the church might have taught you, not what actually God wanted you to learn. 
Because I can read the Bible and I can prove to you 100% that the Bible is teaching Islam. Jesus was teaching Islam. But why else would he say to the people, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. If we know English, then we know what the pronoun our means. I'm a guest in Malaysia. I'm a guest in the University of Nottingham. Can I say to you now as a guest, our university is fantastic? Why? I'm an outsider. What am I supposed to say? Your university is awesome. Besides the nakedness, everything else is good. <laughs> Great, it's nice campus, greenery, nice sandwiches at that place over there, fresh juice, watermelon, pineapple, can't get better than that. Huh? Besides that, the other day, everything is good. But I would have to say yours. So Jesus, I don't know, yeah, basic stuff. Jesus speaking to the people in the most basic language. The Lord our God is one, not one in three, in three in one, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. All this he never said. He never said. He kept it crystal clear for the people. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. This is Islam. And in the Quran, you find the same kind of reference. In the Quran, Allah said that Jesus said to his people, In Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'abuduhu, hala sirat al-mustaqim. Very Allah is my Lord and your Lord, so worship Him. That is the straight path. And Allah said, قُلْ إِنَّ صَلَاتِي وَنُسُكِي وَمَحْيَايَ وَمَمَاتِي لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Say, verily, my prayer, my sacrifice, my life and my death are all for Allah, the Lord of everything. لا شريك له He has no partners. This is the same concept of love the God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. But we don't read those. We read a verse which have been taken out from some of the Bibles. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall have eternal life in that verse, so on and so forth. Go get the different versions of the Bible and see whether this verse is consistent and found in every version of the Bible. See how one will say begotten, one will not say begotten. See the footnotes, see the commentary of the Christian theologians and scholars, not those of Islam, Muslims, to realize what is being said. Besides the fact that this is being attributed to Jesus, versus what Jesus said himself. And I as a Muslim, I prefer what Jesus said. When I hear Jesus speaking to me as a Muslim saying, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, I will give more precedence to this statement than someone saying, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Because that is one is attributed to Jesus and another one is being said by anonymous. The authors of the Gospel are anonymous. Mark, Matthew, Luke and John are anonymous. They were not disciples. This is all from, from Christianity, not from Islam. Research, study, but don't believe me. Google it. It's a verb now, by the way. It used to be a noun, proper noun, that's a verb. Google it, you'll see, from Christian sources. So we don't even within Allah then. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merely the Arabic name for the Creator. Jesus did not speak English. Therefore, during his time, if someone said, Hey, Jesus, he would not turn around. He, can anyone claim that Jesus spoke English? The term Jesus, the J sound, is actually in English. And who speaks Spanish here? Anyone speak Spanish? No Spanish speakers? Only myself? One person. Can you tell me the name of Jesus in Spanish? Jesus. 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 Where's the J? There's no J. There's no J. In Arabic, his name is Aisa. Jesus. Aisa. Versus Jesus. In terms of proximity and being close, Jesus and Aisa are close. But what was his name in actual Hebrew? And what was the name of God in Aramaic? The language of Jesus, it was El. And Elah. And the plural of that is Elohim. So now you tell me El Elah and Allah, which is the language of Jesus and the Arabic language. These are closer to what Jesus was saying to the people than the English language. 
with all due respect to the English language. Furthermore, the term Allah in Arabic is a unique term in and of itself, unlike the term God in English. In English, when you want to differentiate between the God and a God, you have to either write a capital letter or a lowercase small letter. So when you see capital G, that's like the God, and when you see a small G, it could be referring to Satan, it could be referring to an angel, as for the Bible. There's a feminine form of the word goddess. God, goddess. And there's a plural form, gods. The term Allah does not have a plural, does not have a feminine or a masculine kind of gender, and it cannot, it cannot be pluralized, and it cannot be changed. So it becomes the most befitting name for the Creator in regards to calling on Him. But as for the essence, we're speaking about the Creator. In Christian context, the Father. The Father, that's what they call Him. In Islam, my Father is my Father. That's it. And Allah is my creator, who created me and my father. Because the term father could be a biological father, it could be a figure of speech. However, because of the usage of the term, it did lead people to believe in that Allah begotten a son. The begotten son of God. So the whole figurative language was also lost somewhere in between until it is claimed that Jesus is actually the begotten son of God. So what does begotten mean? Go and look it up in the dictionary. To, to know exactly what begotten means. It has to do with the whole sexual relation producing a children, a child thereof. So Allah Azzawajal, when we say Allah was speaking about the Creator. You know what? Let's skip that. We don't want to differ on the name. You want to call him God, no problem. You want to give him another name to refer to the Creator. What we are most interested in is that we agree about who He is. And what is He not? It's very important. Affirming certain qualities and negating others. So when we come to affirm, we affirm the fact that Allah, the Creator, is all-knowing is all capable, is all seeing, is all hearing. Neither slumberness nor sleep overtakes him. He does not get tired. He does not get tired. Because you will find references, biblical references, that God in Genesis, I believe chapter 3, verse 3, that God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and then he rested on the seventh and was refreshed. And Allah, in answer to that in the Quran, says, وَلَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَمَا بَيْنَهُمَا فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامٍ وَمَا مَسَّنَا مِنْ لُغُوبٍ And verily we have created the heavens and the earth and whatever is in between them in six days and no fatigue touched us. God doesn't get tired. <coughs> God doesn't get refreshed. God is not unaware to be told about things. God sees us, hears us, knows about the very deep thoughts that no human being can see. No one knows what you're thinking right now. The closest person next to you, whose arm may be, may be stuck to yours, does not know what you're thinking. I don't know what you're thinking. The only one who knows what you're thinking at this very moment, all of you, in fact, all of mankind on earth simultaneously without all this information congesting any, creating any conflict or confusion is Allah. He knows all of that. And He is self-sufficient. And self-sufficiency requires that He does not need to go out of His way to do anything. He simply says to the thing, be and it is. This is being said because we are being told sometimes that when Adam and Eve sinned and disobeyed God, 
there was no forgiveness granted to them. And then that sin continued to multiply and multiply and multiply until it became so humongous without any forgiveness being provided. Until it was required that a divine sacrifice is made. Therefore it is claimed that God became a man or gave birth to a son or begot a son without giving birth. All kinds of options are available. And then that son had to be crucified, buried, and resurrected in order for the human beings to be saved. So God had to choose the most beloved to himself, his own son, and have people humiliate him, spit on him, and, and torture him in order for you and I to have a good time. And when asked if this is really the case, how many years ago was Jesus walking the face of this planet? Who will give me an answer now without thinking too long? This is one of the easiest answers and almost no one ever gets it. 2013! Duh! Why do you think we're in 2013? So, were there human beings before Jesus? Yes or no? How many? Countless. How many years? Countless. What did they have to do? What was their source of salvation if they did not get the chance to meet Jesus because he simply wasn't there around at that time? Either you say they're included in salvation. We say that's not fair because we know some of them would have rejected him. Like the Jews rejected him. Like people reject him today. The only religion besides Christianity which acknowledges Jesus is Islam. The rest of religions reject him until the moment. So to say all of these people wholesale are going to paradise is unfair. Because some would have rejected him. And to say that no, none of them will go to paradise. Because they didn't get the salvation of Jesus. We say that's also not fair. Because some would have accepted him. So we have a serious dilemma. A serious dilemma. So Allah does not do this to His creation. He does not go out of His way in order to get things done. When Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they felt sorrow, they felt remorseful, they felt guilty, they turned in repentance to Allah as clearly mentioned in the Quran, and Allah accepted their repentance. However, when you commit a crime, there's a consequence. Even though you may go to prison for five years and then be released, it will be on your record. When you go apply for a job and they do a background check, they will know you, you cannot, even if you've gone over that crime, it cannot, you cannot erase it from your past, from your history. Therefore, even though Adam and Eve were forgiven, they were sent down to earth as a consequence of that sin. But they were forgiven. And therefore, we were all given a chance now to reclaim our location in paradise with everyone being given a fair shot. Everyone being given a fair shot. Even those who never received the message, they're being given a fair shot because Allah knows about them. And on the Day of Judgment, a special uh, examination or test will be made for them because in this worldly life, they never received the message of Islam. It could have been a deaf person, a blind person, someone who was living out in some, some area that did, no messenger came to them and so on and so forth. Even those are not excluded from being given a fair shot in this life and in the life to come. So that's what Allah is. So I, I, uh, you know, I, I urge you to understand that when Muslims say Allah, we're not speaking about a personal God. We're speaking about our God. Everyone here and everyone outside. Whether you believe in Him or you don't, you acknowledge Him or you don't, you accept Him or you reject Him, that's none of my business. But if you believe in a creator, then that is Allah. And the term Allah is the most befitting. The second misconception is that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the founder of Islam. Like someone, you know, someone founded some institute or university or something of the sort. Basically, he came up with it from scratch, and therefore it's his own invention. And we say this is a misunderstanding of the term Islam. Let's just do a quick, 
quick analysis. If you know that is. Buddhism is named after who? Buddha. You know Buddha. Hinduism is named after what? No one knows, huh? Any Hindus here? Does anyone know what Hinduism Hinduism is named after? Yes, sister? It's a river in India, the Indian River. Okay, so it's a location, geographical location. Judaism is named after what? The tribe of Judah. Christianity is named after what? Christ, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Islam is named after what? Nothing and no one. Nothing and no one. Even the name is universal. The name is international. The name is not restricted by any location or any person. You're not waiting for one person or being part of one location for you to get salvation. Islam is a concept. It can be translated to thousands of languages. Any language, any the word equivalent to submission would be the meaning of Islam in your language, your respective language. Islam is a concept of submitting your will to the will of Allah. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came simply to fulfill the same exact message that Jesus had come with, and Moses, and Abraham, and Noah, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Jonah, every single one of them came with the same universal message. That all mankind, there's a creator who created you, so you're not here to play. There's a day of judgment, so prepare yourself for that day, and then there's accountability based on what you do. Then there's a final destination, heaven or hell. The details of the religion changed between them. Some of them had certain restrictions, while others were more relaxed, and so on and so forth. That's not an issue in terms of the, the law, the legality and the law of the, the, the Prophet himself. But in terms of the belief system, that it was universal amongst all of them. So the Prophet Muhammad is nothing more but a fulfillment of what the previous messengers and prophets foretold and prophesied. And we can give a whole lecture about what the Bible says about the Prophet Muhammad but that would take up our time. But I urge you to do your research again. Type Muhammad in the Bible and see the references from the Old Testament and the New Testament. And go study the Greek language and realize how the name was translated conveniently. Even though you're not allowed to translate people's names. If your name is is John Green. It's a very common last name. I cannot say in Arabic your name is uh, Joseph Akhtar. <laughs> Mr. Akhtar, come forth. What is, what is Akhtar? Well, Green in Arabic is Akhtar. I'm forced to call you Green even though in my language Green doesn't exist. You don't have the right to change someone's name and translate it and call them by that name. You may use it for entertainment. By the way, your name means that. So the Prophet Muhammad, which was, which, was, which was mentioned by name Muhammadin in the Bible, was conveniently translated to comforter, counselor, different words were given, you know, uh, in order to, perhaps some people wanted to not provide the truth for the, for the truth seekers. But do your research and you will know that he was mentioned. He was not the founder of Islam. And Islam is a religion which you and I, M-U-S-T, Follow. You say, what? You're trying to shove your religion down my throat and I don't think this is adequate and this is not diplomatic and politically you blah, blah, blah. So look, this is all the worldly uh, you know, uh, restrictions that we've created and we found ourselves. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, as per the teachings of the Creator, this is how it is. If you're a Christian, then you're coming to the nearest religion of what you have been following with the modifications in regards to who God is and who Jesus is. You will still believe in Jesus, but he's no longer a God or the Son of God. He's the mighty messenger of God. Born miraculously? Yes. No father interference? Yes. Gave life to the dead? Yes. Healed the blind and the leper? Yes. Almost everything is identical. We differ about his role, as a human being versus a divine being, and we differ about his crucifixion. We believe he was he was raised to the heavens. Allah raised him unto Himself. He remains alive. The only prophet we Muslims believe is alive until now, as I'm speaking to you, is Jesus, the Son of Mary, peace be upon him. 
And this world will not come to an end until Jesus returns. As a Jew, you know better. As a Hindu or a Buddhist, I call on you to reflect. Are you simply following the religion of your forefathers? Or have you actually done the research and come to realization that that religion is actually from God? It's not about whether it appeals to you or not. It's about whether this religion is from God Himself. Whether the scripture you follow is revealed by God. Because I'll tell you, if we leave it up to human beings to worship their Lord the way they like, we will have a bazillion religion. Some people think worshiping God is by dancing. And others want to sing. And others want to clap. And someone will run around the track ten times. Say, this is how I worship God. What's your, what's your business? And some people will meditate. And some people will do this. And it's endless. Everyone, every day will come up with his own way. So how do we know that which religion is the one belonging to God? The one which he revealed. He already told you what, you, what he wants you to do and what he does not want you to do. You say, but why? We should leave us. God should leave us alone. Why does God want us to worship him? What is this egoistic God? It's amazing what human beings say about their creators. Amazing, amazing. The audacity. This, this self-conceited God wants us to all worship him. You know, what, what's up with that? Is this how you show appreciation, yeah, Captain? Is this appreciation someone who gave you your, you know, your life and your soul and your health and your wealth and the intellect and the eyes and the ears and the mouth, everything, every single thing you have is from God, from Allah. You can't control Jack, as they say. You can't control anything. This is the appreciation from God. We don't worship Him because we are being forced, because Allah gave the human beings a free will. فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Whosoever wills can believe and whosoever wills can disbelieve. No one will force you. However, do we want to adore this God who is so full of praise and worthy of praise? Yes, we do it willingly. Willingly. No one is twisting my arm to go pray. I want to go pray because I want to show back appreciation and respect and gratitude to the one who has given me everything, to the one who's still giving me everything and controlling everything. If he wills, this earth will split open and will swallow me. What control do I have? What power do I have? Nothing. I'm, I'm helpless. Each one of us is helpless. So this is only being fair with the Creator. It is not that if someone is forcing you, don't want to worship, don't worship. Allah gave you the free will, but He warned us that there's accountability. Why? Because you were not given these things just to try them out. When you are hired by a company and they give you a fat salary and they give you a car and they give you accommodation and they give you an office and they give you a laptop and they may even give you a new wardrobe and they supply you with everything you need. Is it just to go have fun at work? Or are you supposed to give them something back in return? You're supposed to do some work, my friend. You're not, they're not going to give you this as a freebie. There's something that you have to do on your part. So Allah gave us these faculties that we use right now. Just to try them out or are we going to have to do something with them? We have to do something with them. In order to attain the greater uh, you know, achievement in the life to come. Um, among the misconceptions, let me just uh, flip to the other. I forgot my note cards back where I came from, so. We're using the digital alternatives. Islam was spread by the sword. Right? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You know, it's amazing. Amazing when you read the Quran and you see that in the very beginning of the Quran, the very first, second chapter, the first chapter is known as the Fatiha, the opening chapter, seven verses only. It's, it's one page, okay? You open the Quran, I have one, I don't need it, I don't need it, don't get up. The first page, Fatiha. You go to the very second page, is the chapter, al Baqarah, the Ka'ab. And then, from the get-go, from the very beginning, Allah divides the creation into three categories. The first one, the believers. The second one, 
the disbelievers. Regarding the believers, there are around four to five verses describing them, only. The disbelievers, there are only two verses describing them. The third category of people are known as the munafiqun or the hypocrites. Those who pretend but are not. And you will find at least two pages from the beginning of the Quran describing to us the qualities of these hypocrites. So they're, dis they're explained in more detail than those of the believers and those of the disbelievers. Why? Because this is where many human beings, this is the category under which they fall. And what is a munafiq? A hypocrite is someone who says with his mouth what he does not believe in his heart. And these are according to the Quran, according to Islam, the worst of creation. The worst. Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ فِي الدَّرْكِ الْأَسْفَلِ مِنَ النَّارِ وَلَمْ تَجِدَ لَهُمْ نَصِيرًا Verily, the hypocrites will be at the lowest level of the hellfire and you will never find any helper for them. Meaning, we believe the hellfire is at levels. And uh, those who don't believe but are not hypocrites will be actually in a level above the hypocrites. And according to Islam, the, the higher you are in the hellfire, we ask Allah to protect all of us from the hellfire, but the higher you are, the less the, the, the punishment and the less the pain. And the deeper you are, the more severe the pain. So these will be in the lowest level of the hellfire. Why? Because they say with their mouth, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. But internally they don't believe. They're just faking it. And Islam being spread by the sword entails that I have to, as a Muslim, stand in front of you, a human being, with a gun or a knife or a sword. The sword was used because that was what we used back then any form of machinery and I'm forcing you to say with your mouth what you don't believe in your heart which according to our religion would put you in that worst category of people you're better off remaining on this other religion of yours so it is impossible for someone or for Muslims to force this kind of other people it has to come from your heart we don't want no Muslim wants another person to say the shahada just to make us happy we don't get paid for this stuff so you all better just as if he says the shahada they give me a hundred ringgits, I don't care whether he needs it or not. I'm good to go. I did my job. No Muslim on earth will say that. We say keep your money. Is this person sincere? We want sincerity. We want the truthfulness from the heart. So to go into the historical facts, which are many, the fact that until now in Egypt, the Coptic Christians have been living there ever since ever. And in Lebanon, the Christians are still there. And all over the Muslim world, Christians and Jews remain to be living alongside the Muslims. If our religion was spread by the sword, as in, we had to force Islam upon them, all of them would have died a long time ago. We would have killed them by now. Because either they would have accepted Islam or they would have been killed. That's what it's spreading by the sword means. So how come they're still living there? Because that is not the case. Now that does not mean that there is no war in Islam, hey, hey. I'm not one who lies or sugarcoats or compromises to make people happy. And I'm not trying to sound like Abu Salam because now we're starting to sound the same. I've always said that. I've always said that. I'm not going to change anything and I'm not entitled. I'm not entitled as a human being to change anything. And this reminds me, another comment which I received is that uh, perhaps a woman should address the issue of women in Islam. Why is it a male? Because if it's a male, he's going to be biased for the males. And I will tell you that if a sister was sitting here, she would have to say exactly what I said. Because I'm not representing Abu Musa'ab, I'm representing Islam. So you bring anyone here who has knowledge of this deen, and he is, will have to tell you exactly the same thing. So whether it is a male or a female delivering the speech, it's irrelevant at this point because the content has to be identical. Because we're not talking about my perception of Islam, we're talking about what Islam teaches what Islam teaches. So spread it by the sword, don't even bother. You want me to elaborate? You ridiculing, I will elaborate. But at the end of the day, there's no such thing. War exists. What is war in Islam? Today, war and terrorism have become synonymous. Or Islam and terrorism have become synonymous. Holy war. Eh, holy war. Muslims are engaging in holy war all over the world. Trying to kill all these non-Muslims that come, come their way. Really though? 
Are, are you up to date with politics? Do you check what's going on in the world? I, I'm telling you, right now as we speak, the Muslim countries are attacking or being attacked. Do I have to name them? Do I really have to name Palestine and Iraq and Afghanistan and the list goes on? Do I have to? Look at history. Who are the ones always being nailed and being killed in the name of whatever, whether it is Crusaders or in the name of some other World War I or World War II, whatever. We are always being beat up. And if one dares, dares to stand up for his right, automatically he's called a terrorist. And the ones doing the terrorism, they're just totally fine. They are the freedom fighters. They come to your land, they, they attack you in your own home, they rape your own wives and children, no problem. They are fighting for freedom just in case one day you decided to go to their country so they have this, you know, they will come and take care of you before you ever reach that point. Come on now. Is this fair? We are being terrorized, let alone being terrorists. But are there terrorists in Islam? Yes. 100% a bunch of wackos. I will tell you, for a person in the same mind to go into a train station or a supermarket or an airplane or whatever, whether the Muslims were involved or not with 9 11, we're not going to repeat last year's lecture. For a Muslim to go on a plane or whatever with a bunch of civilians, a bunch of regular people going about their business, living their lives, earning a living, and to go and scream Allahu Akbar and then blow himself up is haram, is forbidden in our religion. And one of the greatest crimes one can commit. And this person will be in such trouble on the Day of Judgment, I can't even begin to explain. You taking away one soul, one soul, innocently, an innocent soul, you take it away oppressively, and you are, you are entitled to enter the hellfire, let alone two people, three people. In fact, our religion teaches that the first thing that the people will be held accountable for on the Day of Judgment is blood. All the blood, all the blood which was spilled unlawfully will have to be paid back to the people. And Islam teaches that if you were to verbally abuse someone, if you were to steal money from someone, then on the Day of Judgment this person will come and will be your contender. And your good deeds will be taken away from you. you. Let's say you had a billion good deeds in your lifetime. And yet you've harmed 20 people. You've harmed them verbally, physically, you beat them up, you stole their money, you cheated them, whatever you've done. On the Day of Judgment you have 20 people waiting to take their right back from you. And according to the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, these people will come, and your good deeds will be there. They will continue to take away from that person's good deeds until they are paid back. And in the case that you run out of good deeds, the billion are gone. Paying back the people you killed, and the people you harmed, and the people you abused. What will happen now that you have zero good deeds? It doesn't even end. The hadith says, the narration says, that their evil deeds now will be taken off of their backs and they will be placed on your scale and then you will be cast into the hellfire. A Muslim, I'm speaking about a Muslim. A Muslim will go to the hellfire because of killing an innocent soul. When Muslims engaged in war, because they had to engage in war, because war and having an army is, as they say, is every country's right. And if people have an objection to that, then I call on them to call on their government to throw away the weaponry in the ocean. Why do you have Marines and Navy and what have you? Why? Why do you have all that? If you don't need it, say what? We need it for protecting our soil in case a, an invader comes around. Sometimes we have to do primitive strike and so on and so forth. Okay, so you are a nation and we are a nation. We are a nation. Muslims are a nation. We're not just countries. We are a nation. We have the same rights as you. If we don't deserve these rights, neither do you. If you deserve them, so do we. Don't play games and have this double standard stuff. Yet, yet, when we have to engage in war, check out these rules. A Muslim is not allowed to destroy a house, so no bombing homes. A Muslim is not allowed to burn a tree, so no burning trees. A Muslim is not allowed to kill an animal. A Muslim is not allowed to kill a woman. A Muslim is not allowed to kill a child. I 
guess I killed a child. <laughs> Is he okay? Can you believe that? Now tell me by Allah, which country on earth, on earth does this? Which nation is following these rules and regulations? Who are they bombing? Children are born on wedding. A people will be having a wedding, they will come and drop a bomb and then kill everybody. Yeah, the, the audacity and the carelessness regarding other human beings is unbelievable. During a people's, uh, you know, enjoyment, they ruin it. Funerals, they bomb funerals. They are already, they're already upset and sad that someone died, they will kill the rest. It's amazing. Women are the, the ones being killed, children are being killed. This is not part of our religion. Islam does not allow us to do that. During one of the wars, the Prophet peace be upon him was walking by, he saw a dead woman. He had to stop. Say, this woman was never to be fought. Why is this woman here? Why was she fought? He didn't say, well, this is a casualty of war. We have no choice, she was under the fire. She was in the line of the fire, whatever the terminology they use in the military now. He made this an issue to the people. This woman was never to be fought. This woman was never to be killed. So look at these teachings, these noble teachings, which you find in the Quran and the Sunnah. Not that I am inventing them. So this whole thing of Islam being spread by the sword is, is, a, is a worthless claim that history refutes, logic refutes, and the textual evidences from our resources refute. So it's up to you to accept that or not. The last one I will address, because I know these, the rest will come in the Q&A, is the uh, Islam is against democracy. Yeah? Democracy, democracy, democratic, blah, blah, blah. This is all we hear today. And many people don't know what democracy is. Can anyone give me a definition? Any person here who's done some, is in maybe, you know, a major in politics or something? I don't know if you teach politics in the school. But anyways, anyone can define democracy for me here? Yes, sir. Democracy is the government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Thank you very much. So it's all run by the people. There's another definition, by the way, just so you will add that to your, to your uh, general information. The freedom to call something into being which did not exist before. That's another meaning of democracy. So we say, wait a second. Uh, you mean by democracy that we come up with our own laws that are suitable for us? And then that should apply against all the subjects of the state? Is that fair? Why? Are we all the same? Couldn't it be that the... Okay, let's just say Excuse my language. I'm not going to curse, don't worry. <laughs> but let's say that those who were in charge, that government, or the people who were the elite, happened to be homosexuals. What do you think the law which they would come up with, which would be convenient for them, would be pro-homosexuality or against it? Pro. Are there people from among the society which are against it? 100%. So where's the democracy? In essence, you're just imposing a law that is favorable to you, that is convenient for you or whoever you are in church, in charge. Church. <laughs> yeah? Sometimes it is like that, like that, by the way. That's what it is. So that this whole Islam says, yes, if this is what you mean by democracy, no. No, we are against democracy tooth and nail. Why? Because we have a divine law inspired by the Creator. Who knows the, the product better than the manufacturer? The manufacturer knows the product the best. That's why when you buy any gadget, it comes with instructions. It will tell you, do not put it in extreme temperature, uh, keep it away from fire, do not use if the battery is blah, blah, blah. They give you instructions. If you were to ignore these instructions and your item were to go bad, you have no warranty because they told you, we told you that you cannot do ABC and you did ABC. You can't tell them, I know this product more than you. They say, yeah? Well, then why did it go bad? Why did it go bad? They know, that's why they put this for you. Who knows the human beings? Allah. So he told us what is good for us. Now, what is good for us may not be agreeable to everyone, but it doesn't mean that it is not good for us, because we already said good could not necessarily be something you like. What is good for you is that you study all night, but you don't want to study all night. What you prefer is to party all night. 
Great, you prefer to party all night and you know do all that stuff and be cool, but you have to study that. That's good for you, but it sucks. And sometimes what we are being told to do may not be the thing that you like the most, unless you have such love for God, where you love what He legislated. This is a higher level of spirituality which we are all invited to attain. But at the end of the day, our expectation is just to carry out the command. So these laws were already revealed by Allah. So if human beings are going to invent something which contradicts that, then we don't really need it. But does certain aspects of democracy, are they part of Islam? 100%. Like what? Like the ruler and the ruled, in a sense, the laws apply against both. You cannot, because you're the ruler, be above the law. Therefore, you commit a crime and no one can hold you accountable, but if someone from the subject uh, uh, violates the law, then you can take him and bring him to account. No. Islam says, this is not allowed. If the law applies against you, it applies against the ruler. When a woman stole at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and someone tried to basically negotiate with the Messenger of Allah, so that they do not apply the capital punishment of, of cutting the hand, he said, by Allah, if Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, were to steal, I would apply this ruling against her. His own daughter. Even though he can say to the people, I'm the messenger of God, come on, give me some, cut me some slack here. You're not even going to treat me like everybody else? I'm chosen by God. This is not Islam. Islam says you, everybody, is, is binded and has to abide by the law. So democracy, it depends on how you define democracy. There are democratic concepts that are agreement with Islam, but the general concept of democracy, which means human beings come up with their own laws, therefore uh, dismissing and ignoring and setting aside the laws of Allah, no, 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 then this is not a part of Islam. Anyways, even though I can go longer, I will shut up and uh, give you the chance to handle and ask me these questions which you've been, you know, holding on to ever since I started, hoping I will finish soon.